Hey there guys, it's Mr. Herbst here, and today my focus is going to be on the forces of evolution. Now before I go any further, I want to make sure that we all are comfortable with this definition of evolution. The definition we are going to use is that, dev that evolution is a change in the gene pool of populations over time. Now you may be familiar with Pokemon, how Caterpie can evolve into Metapod and Metapod can evolve into Butterfree. Well really that is not a very good example of evolution. That's not how evolution works. That is more of an example of um, metamorphosis. However, evolution, and this is the most important thing to understand in this entire unit, evolution works on populations. Individuals or individual organisms don't evolve. Populations evolve. So what actually is a population? Well, let's look over here at these chickens. Let's look at here at this black one here. This black one here has the genes to be a black chicken. Now if we take and we include not only the genes to be black, but also this organism's genes to be black and white, this organism's genes to be white, this one here to be brown, this one here to be tan, that is what we call a gene pool. A gene pool is the collection of the genes within a population. So all of the genes that exist in this population of chickens combined are what we call a gene pool. This is capable of evolving. This chicken cannot evolve. However, all of the chickens are capable of evolving as a whole. And so anytime there is a change in the gene pool, that is what we call evolution. And that can occur in five different ways. The first kind is through genetic drift, where there sort of is this loss of genes in the gene pool due to random chance. And so here I have a picture of some dice. Dice are a really good example of a random occurrence. So anytime that we have a random chance or random elimination of genes, that is genetic drift. And that ultimately can occur in one of two different ways. The first way is called the bottleneck effect, where there is sort of this catastrophic event that leaves only a few individuals left within a population. So let's go ahead here and look at this bottle right here. Let's say that this is an original population. We have purple genes, we have uh, green genes, we have yellow genes, and if we turn a bottle over, you know that, uh, that um, things can't fall out of it so well. There's going to be very, um, a very small amount of things that fall out of it. And so that's sort of the bottleneck effect. Only uh, this is not where like things are falling out. This is a catastrophic event that is killing most of the genes that exist in that population. So right here, let's say this is something like a volcano that eliminates the majority of all of the genes in that population, leaving only just a few. So maybe just some purple ones and maybe one or two green ones. And so those organisms right there, those, those select few genes are the only ones available capable of forming a new population. And now you may be kind of wondering, why do I have a picture of a seal over here? This is a picture of an elephant seal. That's kind of uh, one of nature's clowns. They're pretty funny looking. And anyway, in the 1800s, there, they were hunted nearly to extinction. In fact, there was only about 30 or 30 to 50 individuals of elephant seals left. All, on all of planet Earth, they were nearly wiped out. And what's even more interesting is that there were only maybe one or two males left in that entire population. So if you think about it like this, those one or two males, if you're familiar with the Adam and Eve story of the Bible, those one or two males are sort of like the Adam of the new population. Whereas all of the genes that existed in that one single male are now the descendants, are now going to be passed through the, the descendants of that one single elephant seal. It just so happens that now we have uh, around three or to five thousand or several thousand elephant seals uh, that exist. So it's one of the great, uh, humanity's greatest success stories of bringing back a nearly extinct species. But if you think about it, all of those seals that exist around today all have the genes of that original one or two males that still exist that existed from that original bottleneck. Another way genetic drift can occur is through the what we call the founder effect, where there is a random sample of a population that say migrates and forms a new population somewhere else. 
So over here, let's say that we have a population and a lot with have a lot of variation of different beetles. Well, if we have just a few of those beetles um, randomly go off and form a population, say they, they they go and form a population on a new island. Well, um, first off, let's take a look here. These red beetles here are not part of that new founding population. So therefore, we never are going to see red beetles show up in this new population over here. And so um, let's say that, for example, only brown ones and yellow ones make it to the new island. Well, those are going to be the only ones capable of founding that new population. The second way that evolution can occur is through what we call non-random mating. So let's look at here at this beetle right here, this brown beetle. If this beetle was to mate with, say, light-colored brown beetles, other brown beetles, and, say, orangey-yellow beetles, that's what we call random mating. However, if that beetle only likes, maybe, maybe for some reason it's only attracted to other brown beetles, that's what we call non-random mating, where organisms sort of uh, choose who they like to mate with. And so hopefully you can kind of see that if a brown beetle only mates with the brown beetle, what kind of babies are they going to have? They're only going to have brown babies. So that changes the gene pool because now instead of having the colors, say, uh, light brown and orangey yellow, now in the future we're only going to see brown beetles show up just because of the fact that brown beetles only like to mate with brown beetles. A third way that evolution can occur is through what we call my, my, uh, mutation. First off, we need to make sure that we recall what mutation is. Muta mutation is a random change in the DNA of one single individual. Now hopefully you can kind of see that if we change the DNA of one single individual, it's going to ultimately have to change the gene pool. So for example, if we had a, a seed uh, mutate and became yellow, when all the rest are green, that changes the gene pool. Now, it just so happens that all of uh, most of the mutations are deadly, so they don't actually end up showing up. For example, cancer is a type of mutation, so when organisms develop cancer, they typically die off. So mutation doesn't really contribute to the evolution of organisms uh, so much. However, um, if there was a random change in the DNA of an individual, of course it is going to change the DNA of the gene pool as a whole. Next, the uh, fourth way that we see evolution occurring is through this process called gene flow, a.k.a. another name for that is called migration, where genes can sort of migrate in and out of the gene pool. Migrating in is called immigration. Migrating out is called emigration. So, for example, if we have two different populations of beetles, say they have typically been separated by a, uh, a long distance, uh, we'll call that population one and population two. Population one is primarily green, population two is primarily brown. Well, for some, if, if, a, if a, a beetle from population two, if a brown beetle comes over and starts mating with the beetles in pro population one, that's going to change the gene pool. We have these new genes, these brown genes entering population one. So ultimately, that is going to change the gene pool. Possibly in the future, there could be some brown beetles that show up in population one just because of the brown beetles sort of immigrating into the population. And finally, the fifth way that evolution can occur is through natural selection. This happens to be probably the thing that most people are familiar with. They are Most people typically are not familiar with that evolution occurs in several ways, not just natural selection. But according to natural selection, um, it's sort of where nature, uh, like the bad phenotypes, the bad adaptations are less likely to show up in the next generation. So nature sort of gives the thumbs down to uh, to adaptations that are no good, that won't allow organisms to survive very easily. And on the other hand, though, nature sort of gives a thumbs up to the good adaptations, the ones that will allow them to survive easier in an environment get the thumbs up. Thus, those are going to more likely show up in the next generation. And so nature is all about choosing which phenotypes slash adaptations are going to show up in the next generation. 
So for example, if we take a look over here at these crows, they love to eat beetles. And it just so happens that these orange ones here are better at uh, blending into their background. The green ones show up a lot easier. And so these crows here are eating mostly the green beetles. Um, and so over time, hopefully you kind of see that over time, give it maybe 10, uh, 100, maybe thousands of years, there is going to be this selective pressure for the orange ones to survive more than the green ones. So eventually this population of beetles will probably become more and more orange. And that happens because the orange ones have a better adaptation for surviving on, in that environment. Remember, an adaptation is anything that allows an organism to survive and reproduce better than other organisms in their environment. And so I'm going to somewhat switch gears here and talk about the difference between micro and macro evolution. Now, the term micro means small. So microevolution is where we have small-scale changes to the gene pool. So, for example, if we take a look here, this is a wolf. A lot of people didn't know this. But wolves and dogs are actually capable of still breeding and producing offspring. Um, wolves and dogs are, are not very far apart on the evolutionary tree. The genes are still close enough to produce fertile offspring. However, wolves, eventually, human beings evolved them into dogs. And so even though um, we didn't have this huge jump in species, say like a wolf going from into evolving into a whale, there wasn't this huge jump in, in species, but there was a small scale change where, you know, there, there, there is a change in basically the appearances and behaviors of an organism. And also, if you look at it like this, all dogs are capable of interbreeding as well. You know, all, all different dogs, a Dalmatian and German Shepherd, are capable of interbreeding, even though they look very different. So there is, uh, there is no change in, say, the species or large-scale changes. However, there's more of a change in just the appearance of the things. That's the opposite of macroevolution, where macroevolution is where we have large-scale changes. So, for example, if we take a look over here and say that th this, th let's say that this here is a wolf. If there was a wolf that was capable of, of living on the beach and hunting and going out into the ocean and catching its prey, the organisms, the wolves that are better suited at doing that are going to be the ones more likely to survive. So eventually over time, uh, certain adaptations that allow wolves to uh, live better in the water are going to take hold. So eventually maybe they'll evolve certain traits that allow them to uh, live both on land and in the water, kind of like modern day sea lions and then maybe give it a, uh, some more time of this selective pressure to live in the water where organisms that can live in the water and hunt in the water are more likely to survive and then maybe you'll end up with something like kind of like modern day seals where they're where they can live on land a little bit but really their habitat is in the ocean and give it more time and maybe there'll be this selective pressure for just living in the ocean alone such as like a whale and so microevolution is where we actually have these huge jumps from one species to another. And it's a lot harder to observe. However, the idea is, or the science has kind of shown, or the theories of evolution sort of show, that if we have small-scale changes, if we have small-scale microevolution, those small-scale changes are going to build up and build up and build up, sort of like a uh, snowball effect, and eventually may lead to microevolution and ultimately what we call speciation. Where speciation is what we call the formation of new species. So species and speciation. And that happens all because of what we call reproductive isolation. Where organisms that no longer mate together will eventually natural selection take over and change the populations. So for example, we take a look over here at this island. On this island we find two species of baboons. One that have spots and one that don't. If there was a giant mountain range that separated them on this island. Now, let's take a look at this population over here and this population over here. Do you think the environment is exactly the same on each side of that mountain range? Well, hopefully, you know, you kind of see, well, it's not going to be exactly the same. It might be similar, but not exactly the same. So guess what happens? Natural selection takes over 
and favors different things. And so natural selection might favor different things over here than it will favor over here. So over time, natural selection is going to give the thumbs up or, or favor different traits and eventually favor or, or um, eliminate the bad genes. So the natural selection is going to be different on each side of that island. And so eventually new species might arise all because of reproductive isolation. Anyway, guys, here, I realize that speciation is a difficult concept. We're going to focus on that a lot more in class. However, make sure that you guys complete the Google form within the description below. But I'm signing off, folks. You all have a nice day.